So welcome to this session at the Swedish Pavilion. Uh, the theme for the session is called for collaboration, developing climate resilient food system pathways. We will have several speakers that will frame this session. And the session is hosted by Rang Cells together with Tetra Pak. My name is Per Larsson, so I'm Director of Sustainability for Rang Cells Group. And we are a family owned company originating from 1881 when we were transporting goods and people with horses. Back then, we also brought back latrines to the surroundings of Stockholm. So already then, we were a part of the food value chain, the way that you brought back nutrients down. Today, we do it on an element level, where we have the potential to bring back both phosphorus, nitrogen, and potassium back into the, into the food system. But we'll hear more about that later. So uh, what I will do is that I will do a short introduction why we have this theme. And uh, it will be in, build on the first session from today. Uh, and we then talked about the importance of scalability for adaptation. Too many initiatives, though, today try to solve the problem just in front of them. And they're causing other problems. So when you're implementing new solutions, you need to understand the consequences. That's the main discussion of this session. Understand how we make it right from the beginning by taking a total system hello, uh, approach. We would like to demonstrate a vision or a goal that we as companies can contribute to. If we understand the direction, it's much easier for us to develop innovations that will reach the society's goal and at the same time, of course, have a op business opportunity. Given the fact that 90% of the population growth the next decades will happen in Africa and in Asia. At the same time as by 2050, we know that 70% of the population will live in cities. We need to make sure that we can create sustainable soup food system pathways. Otherwise, we will have a huge challenge to feed the population without causing problems for the environment. But by the way that we produce food today, both on land and in the aquaculture, is slowly but surely destroying the possibilities to produce the food we need. We will cover both those topics in this session, both food, both the aquaculture and the land. Without further ado, I will now introduce our first keynote speaker that will set the scene. So directly from Stockholm, we have Sibyl Kero from Stockholm Resilience Center. And uh, you will start talking about how is the situation, how can we create those system pathways. So please, Sibyl. The stage is yours. Thank you so much, Per, and thank you so much for the opportunity for being here at the session and presenting. So we don't have so much time, so I will try to be uh, fast. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Yes, so in this talk, I will just try to briefly answer to two questions. The first one is why do we need food systems transformation? Next. And the other one is like, what shall we transform into? Because we need the vision also and how to do it. So how can we make food systems more healthy, sustainable and resilient to climate change or other changes and challenges to come? Next. So we start with this first one, next. And so what we have seen in the latest uh, in the latest years is this very worrying trend of like food insecurity on the rise again. OK, after 40 years of decreasing trends of food uh, insecurity. And this has been, as you know, like particularly difficult in the in the last years. It's extremely worrying trend. Sort of we are back into getting close to one billion, one billion people uh, that are undernourished in the world. Next. So we are just at the middle of a global food crisis. And some of the drivers of this food crisis are like sort of increased weather variability, extreme weather events that are happening all over the world. As you know, like in Africa, in India, we see all over the place, like with prolonged doubts and floods. We also are assisting into an increasing number of conflicts 
that has been one of the main drivers of food insecurity. And also, of course, the economical drivers like catalyzed by the recent um, COVID-19 uh, pandemics. Next. So this is how food systems look like today. We have almost 10% of the world's population that are undernourished. We have almost 30% of the world's population that is food insecure. We have almost 700 million adults that are obese in the world, one in every three women, and also like um, obesity and stunt growth affecting uh, millions of children uh, across the world. Next. And at the same time, land conversion for agriculture has been the main driver of biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation um, in the last uh, six or seven decades. And also we know that food production and consumption, as Per very well said, are responsible for at least like 25 to 30% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. Next. So um, agricultural expansion is the lead driver of biodiversity loss. It has it's it leads to sort of 80% of global de deforestation. This has happened between 2000 and 2010. And also, like we know that from that agricultural land, 80% is used for life livestock production. And livestock production requires 20 times more land and emits 20 times more green greenhouse gases than plant-based protein proteins. In the same way, we also know that like nutrient pollution coming from the use of chemical fertilizers is uh, affecting freshwater and marine ecosystems. Okay, next. So, um, food security is being impacted by climate change. We have a rise in food insecurity that is one of the main causes is being this increase of extreme weather and climate variability. And this is affecting uh, regions in the, across the world differently with uh, more impact on the vulnerable ones. And also like the way how we produce and consume food is one of the main drivers of climate change. So food is both being impact in and impacting climate change. Next. And so what that means is that food is both part of the problem and the solution. So actually, if we build climate resilient food systems, this will have synergetic effects, not only on mitigation, the very impacts of climate change on food security, but also on mitigating the drivers of climate change. And what we know today is that if we fail to transform the food system, we will definitely fail to reach the targets from the Paris Agreement. That's why this, these discussions are so important to bring up to the table. Next. So what shall we transform into? You know, how can we make food systems more climate resilient, more healthy, more sustainable? Next. So I thought I would just give you like very shortly a brief overview of some features or some characteristics of these sustainable, healthy, and climate resilient food systems. A sustainable, healthy, and climate resilient food system is diverse and protects natural capital. And that means that we need to handle, uh, we need to start halting, uh, halting land expansion for agriculture while we at the same time are investing in food security in the regions where we are sort of stopping uh, conversion to agriculture. Um, and for instance, like sustainable intensification is one of the solutions that sort of that can help in this transition. We also need to diversify production away from reliance on major grains only. We know that our food system is sort of dependent on just you know a handful uh, of major grains that we are sort of producing and trading across the world. But this is an extremely vulnerable system. So that means that we need to invest in alternative crops that are more climate resilient. We need also to change the way how we process food to use a more diverse set of ingredients. This will lead to more diverse landscapes in opposition to monocultures as we have today and homogenization trends, and also will help to build sort of market resilience to the climate impacts that we are seeing that might threaten in the future the, the viability of some of these major grains that we are using so much today. Next. We also need to diversify energy sources. So we need to reduce drastically our dependence on fossil, um, fossil fuels, both for food transport, but also for in terms of artificial inputs uh, that are very sort of um, energy um, 
dependent. Then we also need to diversify fertilizers. So like reducing the reliance on energy intensive synthetic fertilizers. Uh, and by doing this, we will also mitigate soil and water pollution that is coming from the overuse of these chemicals. And, and also recognize that food landscapes don't give just food. They give a whole bunch of other benefits that also have a market value um, and that are um, good for biodiversity and for climate resilience. Next. Then climate resilient food systems need to manage connectivity. So like if we are up to build resilience to unexpected climate related events, such as this extreme weather and food systems need to be connected by trade, absolutely, because we need to ensure that we have outside sources of resilience in case of sort of, for instance, local shocks in food production. Uh, but we also need to make sure that we are not over connected as we are today. Uh, so that local shocks don't spread across the system at the same speed. This is something that happened with the COVID-19, but it happens all the time with other sorts of shocks. Like you have like sort of a, a shock in production due to an extreme weather event in one part of the world that just cascades in a bunch of other shocks in other parts of the world. So that will mean like to achieve a better balance between sort of global trade and more local and regional markets. So sort of connecting smallholders to both um, and to sort of uh, have new trade policies and regulations that address this and that protect smallholders. Next. Um, then climate resilience food systems will also need to promote circularity, reduce waste and tackle diets and demand side policies. So one of the major pillars of this is of course the diet shift. We need to shift from animal-based to plant-based proteins that will reduce emissions, but also contribute to healthier uh, diets. Um, policy and industry-led measures that can target um, food waste reduction will also have those synergetic effects. So sort of both reducing emissions, but also like being more uh, increasing efficiency and sort of um, bringing large cost savings as well. And then also investing in nutrient recycling to reduce the need for those energy intense synthetic fertilizers that are very used today. And just the final slide, next. So just as final remarks, like if we have interconnected problems, we can also have interconnected solutions. So focus on the synergies. Uh, by investing in climate resilience food systems, we will be sort of addressing the very drivers that are causing the problem. Uh, in this, uh, we need to break silos and to increase multilateral collaborations. This is very crucial. And then we also need to accept that when implementing these multiple solutions, there will we will be finding trade-offs. We will be having unintended consequences, but and we need to learn with that, but that shouldn't sort of stop us from experimenting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Seville. You have a great applause here from the audience. Please stay for, for the panel and reflect for the, for the speakers. Um, what I'd like to do now is to introduce our, our first keynote speaker here on stage, and that's Eya from Tetra Pak. So please go ahead. What is Tetra Pak doing for resilient system pathways going forward? Hello, everybody. Great to be here uh, today. And, and I, I was just, um, you know, reflecting this uh, previous uh, session and, and how it resonated with, uh, with the way we think, uh, think about things and the food systems at Tetra Pak. So uh, for those of you who don't know Tetra Pak so well, so we are we're a company with Swedish uh, roots uh, and, uh, and 70 years uh, actually in age uh, this year founded by a Swedish entrepreneur who uh, wanted to change the food systems. So very topical uh, today, uh, in today's time and, and day. Uh, so what we do is uh, we have uh, integrated solutions uh, across uh, the, the food system. So we have uh, uh, food technologies and uh, 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 processing uh, uh, equipment, which help, uh, help actually take the, the food uh, into, into different formats, whether it's powder or, or puree or, or, or beverages. And then we also offer packaging solutions and 
quite innovative uh, such solutions. So we operate globally, uh, but we very much operate locally. So most of our customers are actually local local companies uh, in, in, the, in the local markets, which is really important from the food systems perspective as well. So as, as everything we do is, is really about food, um, we've been thinking, of course, uh, of our role in the, in the food systems and, and more broadly. And uh, last year, when the UN Food System Summit took place for the first time, we really started sketching the different pathways where we saw our role would be in the future and, and how our industry could contribute to, uh, to a more resilient food system, which would be you know, not only resilient in terms of climate, but also from the social aspect to, to support the, the transitions that are needed, not only in the, in the kind of green economy, but linked to that, the, the social uh, justice uh, that, that is very linked to, to, to the food systems. So what we came up with um, was we had a white paper uh, and had uh, some 250 uh, people and institutions co contributed to that. And we identified four pathways, which we believe is that what we, we as a company and our industry could be doing uh, in this area. And I'll just quickly list those four pathways because they actually really resonated with the, with the previous speaker as well. So the first one is, is about healthy diets for a healthy planet. The second one is about food waste and food loss. The third one, which is quite particular for our industry and, and us as a company, is about responsible dairy, the transitions that we need to see in that area. And the fourth area is, is to what is sustainable packaging and sustainable food packaging in particular, because I think in the big debate about uh, the, the packaging of today, about plastics, we've forgotten about the function of that actually uh, packaging serves and especially for to preserve food. So I'll just quickly um, uh, talk about those four areas. And, and again, this is an inspiration for discussion. And what we just heard uh, um, on, on, the, on the backdrop uh, before I started, I think these are also issues that others have noticed. So when we look into uh, what could uh, healthy, healthy diets for, um, for the healthy planet be, we as a company, as I said, uh, we, we do a lot of, uh, we have a lot of technologies uh, for processing food. And we realize that the alternative proteins are really needed to balance off uh, what is out there today, very much animal protein dependent uh, um, food chains. Um, and what we also recognize is that uh, there's a need for new types of crops to be used uh, that are more climate resilient. We need to look at uh, local supply chains, what is available in a given, given country. So these type of solutions, whether it then uses, um, it could be, um, you know, algae-based uh, type of uh, proteins, it could be a different plant-based, so let's say hemp-based uh, proteins, which are actually now growing beautifully in Sweden, for instance, because of climate change. Um, it could be, um, you know, fungi and, and other things. So we're developing solutions uh, and technologies which can leverage that, and we're working with a lot of startups in this area. And I think the plant-based transition is, is critical, but we should remember that if there needs to be a balance and you need to understand what the local supply chains are in order to make this sustainable. And the food needs to be nutritious. Uh, and so there's a balance between nutrition, uh, environment, and social aspects as, as well as nature. So then the second area uh, is, is really about food waste and, and food loss. Um, so we heard here uh, previously that 8% of, uh, of food is actually lost, while we have a lot of people uh, who go, go bed uh, hungry, and we have people who are obese. So what a, what a paradox we have at hand. So there's a lot that could be done with technology uh, to reduce actually food loss and food waste. But what you could also do is uh, you could uh, um, avoid emissions, for instance, in the food processing uh, chain uh, by actually uh, leveraging some of the residues from food processing. So if you take, um, let's say, beer, which I'm sure, Pat, you, you enjoy a uh, beer. So actually, the process uh, uses a lot of barley, um, and, and which is very rich on proteins. But you wouldn't want to have very protein-rich beer because it would taste very strange. So some of these ingredients, uh, they are they actually removed in the process, but they could create very protein-rich beverages. And so we, for instance, have solutions for that type of uh, um, uh, kind of uh, um, end, end uses. So opportunities exist tremendously in, in this area. And again, if this were incentivized, we could do more. Then the third area really is about uh, responsible dairy. 
and and we as a company we are one of the biggest um, enablers of change in the in the dairy value chain because a lot of uh, milk is produced uh, or, or we are part of that the milk chain but also of dairy products so we take our responsibility very seriously we're part of uh, uh, global alliances in this area and and we believe that here uh, there's a lot that could be done in terms of the processing again uh, creating efficiencies in the process but also uh, with the dairy farms and and uh, and already we have solutions uh, or, or we we uh, were engaged in uh, initiatives with dairy farms, uh, uh, or with dairy, uh, dairy farm hubs, uh, where we actually bring together uh, these small uh, holder farmers, and we can offer solutions which, uh, you know, in a cooperative setting, actually reduce uh, emissions, but also reduce uh, um, loss uh, of, of milk and, and provide uh, social uh, support as well. And just to finish off, uh, the sustainable packaging part. Of course, there are different types of packaging. Our packaging that we uh, are famous for is uh, it's called aseptic packaging, which allows uh, its technologies that allow for longer preservation of, of food. So these types of uh, packaging uh, solutions are extremely important in times of crisis, conflicts, and uh, situations which we pretty much are are there currently. So. That's, uh, that's the resilient story, and it's uh, environmental that goes uh, together with societal. That's, the, that's what we believe in. A very impressive story. I think we'll have a pool here also as well. 70 years of, of uh, work enabling the, to be part of the global food value chain. We have something to catch up here from Rank Cell side. Uh, Next speaker will be Jan Svärd, CEO of Easy Mining. And Sibyl started talking about the problems with phosphorus. I totally agree. We have, uh, we're using phosphorus that with high content of cadmium and uranium today that are, of course, destroying the long-term possibilities for us to produce. At the same time, we are also totally destroying our, 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 our nitrogen chain, losing a lot of, 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 of nitrogen in the system. So please, Jan Svärd. Yeah, I think that you have solutions that can increase when it comes to food production, both on land, and but does it within the borders of our planetary boundaries. So please, go ahead. Thank you, Per. Yeah, so both these nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen, is really elements of life. So it's really, you know, some researchers say that 50% of food production will drop unless we can use nitrogen and phosphorus. And when it comes to phosphorus, it's a finite raw material. It exists very unevenly spread in the world. So it's really a key one that is shipped around long distances uh, today. Uh, and there we have developed a solution to bring it out from sludge ash. So basically from wastewater treatment plants and then we recycle it in a very, very pure form. So it's purer than what's now on the market. The second solution that we have uh, is uh, for nitrogen. And nitrogen production today is uh, you know, enormously energy intensive. It's uh, air and natural gas, that is the raw materials. I think this market is around, uh, some say, hundreds of billions of dollars. I don't dare to say the exact number because it goes up all the time. But uh, hundreds of billions and nothing is recycled. As far as I know, it's around zero today. There, we have a solution as well, based, you know, recovering from a wastewater treatment plant or from any liquid in a way, uh, where you catch this in a, in a you know, climate neutral way, or maybe even climate positive way, and uh, produce a fertilizer from it that, that can be used and replacing natural gas and air based uh, solutions. Just one, just one question there. How much nitrogen are you able to then extract from the wastewater treatment plant today at your first fact? Yeah. From, from the, we today re extract it from the reject water. And the runs that we do at the plant right now in Copenhagen, we extract 99% of the nitrogen. So it's a, just 1% left. Good, thank you. So now we we'll, uh, in, introduce the panel, and the first panel is about land. And here we have a new person coming up on the stage. So Irini Pizzirini from your global head of food systems advocacy for the compassion in world farming. So please tell me first, your, what are your organization and what are you doing here at COP? What are your objectives? 
Hi. Okay. Yeah. It's on. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Irini. I'm the global head of food systems advocacy at Compassion in World Farming. Compassion in World Farming is an international NGO that focuses on food system transformation. Uh, mainly, we work on shifting or phasing out uh, high input uh, industrial animal agriculture for systems that are better, are based more on circular economy principles, and work with nature. But we also know that the only way to tackle this is to also look at, at consumption. And at the moment, we know that um, resource intensive food consumption and actually meat and animal protein are quite resource intens intensive foods needs to be discussed when we talk about food system transformation. Um, the organization has uh, offices across Europe, in the US, China, and South Africa. And we're always, uh, my team works on uh, across the UN. So wherever agriculture and food systems are discussed in the UN, we are there. And we see a lot of these discussions happening in silos. And one of the key things that I think will come up later in the panel discussion is how to enhance synergies for all these discussions to happening at the one place rather than in five, for example. So we'll leave it for there for now because I guess we would like to go into the panel discussion. Yes, uh, yeah? I think we can start with you. Reflect, please, on what has been said here from the, the previous speakers. What are your, what are your conclusions or what are your, your feedback? I have, I don't know, yeah, it's all now. So I have to say that I, I agree with everything that was mentioned here. So I agree with everything that was mentioned with, from the Stockholm Resilience Institute and, and, you know, the solutions that we need to bring now into food systems. And there's nothing I can add more in terms of science because it was all been said. There's nothing I can offer more in terms of things that need to be done. For example, looking at systems we have at the moment, looking at how we can make, make them better for social, economic, and environmental issues. Those are the pillars of sustainability. And we need to do this by looking at consumption patterns as well. One of the comments that I, I would like to make as a, a policy sort of international advocacy person is that wherever we have conversations about agriculture and food systems, they never look at consumption. And I think it's, it's, it's absolutely impossible to change the systems if you don't actually discuss those two things in, uh, together as one thing. How you consume drives how you produce and vice versa. And at the moment, we're missing a massive part of the equation by not addressing this. Good. Uh, I think we go to Stockholm now and uh, Sibyl. Your reflection when you hear John and Aya. So first of all, thank you so much. I think it was really exciting to hear like uh, the solutions that you are already implementing and also like your quite holistic view uh, on the importance of sort of thinking in, in, in multiple things. So I was very inspired. I think that the private sector has a, um, you know, a key role in food systems transformation. Like um, I think that many companies can become, can become stewards of this transformation. And uh, we at the Stockholm Resilience Center have been done quite a lot of research about this also, like that sort of many um, companies and including like large scale, large scale companies can become sort of um, keystone actors, let's say, uh, on, on sort of driving this transformation uh, forward. Uh, so like it is and, and it is important then also to have this sort of happening at the big the big actors, but also like the small actors together. So sort of definitely breaking silos across um, across sectors and sort of improving this uh, communication. And and um, I would also like to just build on 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 what the previous speaker just said. That like I totally agree that like both sides of the food system, the production and the consumption need to be taken into account. I would also just like to to leave the the message that. Um, on the consumption side, I think that we often tend to always think about just individual consumers as having the responsibility, but that is very heavy to put that responsibility just at individual le uh, level. So we need to think on other ways of how the society can more collectively sort of address these issues and sort of influence and support like more, more sustainable and more healthy consumer choices. Yeah, I think I stopped there because I know that we are short in time. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Eya, your reflections on the dialogue? Everybody agrees. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that just amazing that we all agree? Does it work, actually? Yes. Yes, and I, I, was, uh, I was also reflecting on this um, um, consumption element and remembering the UN Food Systems Summit last year, I think it was the government of Italy who, uh, who very strongly said food is cultural, so, so you know, don't, uh, don't tell us what to eat. And I think uh, it's, it's a challenging one then, uh, then uh, when, when you start unpacking this, because indeed uh, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, interest in the developed world uh, for many, many kind of uh, groupings to move into, into new types of foods and accept uh, different, uh, you know, protein mixes, etc. But when it, when it comes to, if you have the choice, uh, that's one thing. But when you don't have the choice and, uh, and, and the cultural kind of aspects of food, the transitions, uh, you really need to think, uh, think carefully uh, how, you, how you impose that. And Jon? Yeah, I, I think this is very interesting. As usually, everybody agrees. The only problem is that uh, we all agree it should be circular. You know, we should take care of it and, and so on. But then when it comes to legislation, it doesn't agree. So if you want to use a product from, you know, which is the purest, and it, but it has the origin of waste. We want to have circular, but it's not allowed to use waste-based even if it's purer and better and everybody agrees. So this legislators is not catching up with the business opportunities and the needs of, uh, of uh, the food system. I think that is one of the biggest issues. So that's maybe something where we disagree, but we don't have a legislator here now. Uh, yeah, actually, <laughs> actually, just in looking, looking into novel, novel foods, uh, it's the same. I mean, the processes are longer than pharmaceuticals uh, products, so uh, indeed. Yeah, where are the policymakers here? <laughs> China, China did last night announce that that uh, big countries with a large population can't mitigate their agriculture. They can't contribute to reduce emissions. What is your feedback? China is my. Okay, that's a, that's a difficult question. <laughs> Politics, right? <laughs> that's a difficult question. Um, how would, well, I'm going to start by saying that at the moment having countries at the size of China basically not mitigating or not making, taking extra measures is extremely difficult for the rest of the world to catch up in terms of where we are with emissions. Um, the other thing I want to mention is we actually need to look at what kind of emissions are we talking about. I know the discussion is very much about, and it has to be, about carbon, but actually, and as it was mentioned yesterday by Professor Mark Sutton in another panel, when we talk about carbon, we also need to talk about nitrogen and about other emissions. It's a system. So it's, um, it's not a blanket statement, oh, it's about uh, greenhouse gas emissions. If we look at them separately, and if we look at them specifically, then we may, take, we may need to take specific actions uh, to mitigate specific parts of the system. But going back to the initial question, having a situation where we have a country the size of China with the production China has on all aspects, not taking you know, the lead on mitigating, it's certainly um, uh, as if taking 10 steps forward and then five steps backwards in the global discussion around climate. So, but it's a difficult one, I have to say. So, Jan, on that note, I have a question for you. We know that China is something like 6% of the world resources of phosphorus. At the same time, we know by 2100, there's just one mine left if we don't start to recycle. Shouldn't China do what they can to recycle already now? Of course, they, they would be, they're almost too late already. And China actually stopped exporting phosphorus for this very reason, to keep it in their own country. So that's what I meant when I say it's unevenly spread, the phosphorus resources. I know these, these uh, you mentioned Mark Sutton. He also studied uh, 
the nitrogen industry now, and 2% of the direct carbon dioxide or the uh, greenhouse gas emissions is from the nitrogen production only. And then, of course, he also adds the laughing gas that it contributes with in the wastewater treatment plants with another 5% in carbon dioxide equivalents. So it's not small, it's very big. And I think uh, uh, even for China, this would also be a very good idea because it's, uh, it's a cost saving. It's much better than to ship it from uh, buy natural gas wherever and produce locally and then ship it out. Instead of a, you have a lot of opportunities to do this in highly populated countries. Short comment from Eya and Sibyl about China. I think you're opening up a pretty kind of a geopolitical discussion here. So, so of course, uh, food sovereignty uh, in the in the current food crisis is a uh, uh, is 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 something else than just uh, looking into in environmental issues. And I think that's uh, that's what we see here. And the transition of um, of um, of the kind of agriculture of China into into new models, indeed. Uh, I mean, while desired, uh, I, I think this is playing a, a more political role here than just environmental. But yes, of course, uh, um, we, I think we're going to see more of that. We're going to see more uh, trade policies that are going to restrict the free flow of uh, raw materials and uh, and all that. If uh, the, the worse the, the food security situation, it's going to have impact actually on the progress on, on climate. And unfortunately, I'd be really interested to, to hear your, your views uh, over there, who probably have a better sense of the, the policy uh, sense uh, in, in terms of resilience. Sibyl, <laughs> Sibyl, it's... Yes, I don't have much to add, but of course that it is, it is, I agree with everything that has been said. It's like, it is, um, these are bigger issues and the current food crisis, what it has done is that it, it basically puts the focus on sort of internal food security. And, um, and I think that in many countries, what we have been seeing, it's also that has been like a sort of a, a backlash on sort of climate action. So sort of like, no, now we need to think about food security. And now we, we cannot afford to do the energy transition. And we cannot, when this is actually misleading, because that's exactly why we should afford to do it so that we are not as, so that we don't have a food system that is the, so highly dependent on fossil fuels. Um, on fossil fuels, sort of, we we wouldn't be in in the vulnerable situation that we landed with the with the Russian uh, Ukraine conflict, for instance. Of course, if we would have been, you know, uh, if we have been taken uh, more steps on that direction um, um, already. Um, the intention yeah. was that we should also have a C section or aquaculture section. We will roll that film and have a very short comment from each of you, and then the session is over. Sorry for that. We would like to speak forever here, but we can't. So please roll the film about C. So it's well known that uh, the land area we have today is already overexploited and have limited capacity to grow uh, when it comes to food production. The opposite is the situation with the oceans. There are still only 5% of the food that we eat that comes from the oceans and we can harvest more. We cannot uh, harvest more of wild stocks, but aquaculture is a part of the solution. And with aquaculture, we uh, are using the ocean to grow food by feeding them, by uh, harvesting them, uh, that food, and that is a part of the solution. Aquaculture has also its challenges, uh, but when we are, we are doing aquaculture more controlled by collecting uh, waste streams, we have the opportunity to make also aquaculture more sustainable. Waste streams like the sludge can be used for food purposes, for, as fertilizer or, uh, or as energy. That will also improve food production and improve uh, sustainability in aquaculture. The aquaculture industry, as all other industries and all, especially food production, has a duty to be efficient in its use of resources. And when we uh, have open systems for fish farming, there is a byproduct, or we could call it sludge, that is dispersed to the environment. By collecting this sludge, 
we are doing a double purpose. We reduce the, um, the pollution to the environment and we also collect a, um, a resource that can be used for different purposes, for energy production, for as fertilizer or even for food or feed production. That is a win-win and is what we call upcirculation. What we heard here is that Norway are now putting a solution in place where you collect the fish pop, the fish sludge, and take it up, first produce energy, and then have the potential also to produce phosphorus and nitrogen. Not wasting the resources and a better health as well for, for the fishes. So short reflection on this, and we start with you. Very, very, to start, first of all, to say yes, that we, aquaculture is a, a fast moving and increasing uh, area. We need to again be very, very careful and bring in consumption into the mix in the sense that uh, we need to understand we don't just move from uh, land animals, you know, to aquatic animals without uh, addressing consumption. Having said that, it is a sector, it brings livelihoods, it's there, it's developing. We need to strive to make it more sustainable. So we absolutely need solutions like this. And more importantly, we need solutions on f feed as well, because as it was mentioned, we cannot keep depleting the ocean and taking away fish from the ocean, uh, wild caught fish for fish meal and fish oil. It needs to, we need more sustainability for sure. And those solutions offer that. So, yes. Jorn? I think this is a great opportunity for Norway. I just want to come back a little bit to legislation because there is ways and things you can do. I mean, Jorn realized this phosphorus issue and took a law that you need to recover phosphorus in 2017 and it has to be ready in 2029. You know, Norway have this opportunity, 9,000 tons of phosphorus, huge opportunity also for Norway to get independent of phosphorus. And Eya? I must say that this is not my uh, domain expertise, but of course, uh, if, if you mention that there's uh, food to be made here as well, so we have our, our EVP here who I'm sure is interested in developing processing solutions for this type of raw material and, and bringing it uh, to the market as a novel food. I hope it's a scalable solution and, uh, and resilience uh, obviously is there. Yesterday we had a session with both uh, representatives from Chile and we see the same problem if we don't get out uh, the nitrogen and phosphorus from the sea, then we will have eutrophication and then there will be a huge problem to harvest from the sea as well. That was the conclusion. So this is really scalable and potential all over the world. I will now give the last uh, opportunity to Sibyl, so please reflect on the sea dimension. I must say that the, the video didn't have the sound for me, so I haven't heard about solution. I have understood what it's about. But uh, um, I think that blue food has a huge potential in the food systems transformation uh, uh, sort of transition. Um, and I think definitely aquaculture has a, a major role to play. We need to be, uh, as it was already been said, like very careful uh, on sort of like, it's not my area of expertise either, but we need to be very careful so that we are sort of, um, you know, producing aquaculture sort of in a sustainable way. We need to be careful with the relationships between land and sea, like the food system, it's it's the land and the seascape together. And actually these are much more interlinked already than, than sometimes we see or we think. We have like, you know, we have like sort of things produced by aquaculture that are used to feed animals on land. So we have like shocks that go across these two systems. And these are things that we need to be sort of aware of as we move forward. Um, but again, not being my area of expertise, I do think that there's a huge potential on sort of this type of blue food uh, solutions and definitely with sort of recycling the waste um, from aquaculture and sort of um, reusing it again. I think it's it sounds promising. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sibyl. On the 5th of October, I had the honor to give a keynote when the World Customer Organization uh, set their first symposium on how we can greener the, the trade. And uh, the theme of my, my presentation was, will only be the rich people that can afford to buy eggs in the future? 
And if we can't bring back the nutrients, everybody moving into the city, this will be a challenge going forward. Thank you for listening to this session about both land and sea and about system pathways. We need to have them resilient and we need to make sure that we innovate and scale. That's, our, that's my main conclusion over this session. Thank you so much.